Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. Welcome to the Flora and Friends podcast and to our mini series about pelagoniums. This is the sixth and concluding episode of this mini series, and we're going to dedicate it to the production of rose geranium oil, which is produced from pelagoniums. I have a very insightful interview for you today and my guest is Karen Swanepoel who has been the executive director of the South African Essential Oil Producers Association since the year 2000. Karen has a background in botany and is a researcher and lecturer in essential oils and vegetable oil production and she has also been in the part the local expert on essential oils and vegetable oils in South Africa for UNIDO And UNIDO is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and they promote sustainable industrial development in developing countries to reduce poverty and to promote inclusive globalization. So Karen has so many years of experience in the geranium oil production and all kind of different aspects from the botany to the production to the socioeconomic uh, aspects of it. And it has been a very interesting and pleasant interview. And with that, I wish you a lot of new insights and I say welcome to Karen. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you reached out to me after our, one of our last podcast episodes where we mentioned that um, the rose geranium oil was made from Pelagonium graviolens. And that is actually not totally correct. So do you want to tell us a bit more about what the, the, the like plant basis to the geranium oil is and also how people have come to that exact composition of the hybrid plant that would suit that oil production? Um, yes, sure. Um, I've been in this, um, in this industry for 21 years now, and I've seen it's not, um, it's actually general that people have got the, the name of the rose geranium for essential oil completely incorrect. And the, the reason is because people in the trade are not botanists and the botanists don't really care what happens to the plants afterwards. So it is a general thing. It's not um, individual or, um, you know, one country. It's all over the world. So the um, Pelagonium graviolens is actually one of the mother plants of the hybrid that is currently used for the geranium oil and that is planted all over the world, not only in South Africa. South Africa is actually very small, although we are the country of origin, our uh, production is very, very low. The, uh, the most of the oil is actually coming from, from China um, and Egypt at this stage, but it was well developed in France and Reunion Island. And that's where it, it, uh, it was actually um, made into a hybrid. So the original plant was Pelagonium graviolens, and the other mother plant is Pelagonium capitatum, which has got the distinctive rosy smell. And then they've also included a third one, uh, Pelagonium radens, which has got a very skeleton-like um, leaf, but completely the wrong surface area for, you know, for production. So what we have today is a sterile um, variety. 
And that's why the, the Graviolens is actually one, only one of the uh, mother plants, but it's easy to pronounce, easy to spell. And if you have to include all of them, it just becomes very cumbersome when you write it and the spelling, you know, of all these words is really problematic. So the best way would say it's Pelagonium var rosé because it was hybridized for this rosy characteristic, which is actually from the Capitatum, which has got completely the wrong growth form. If you're a plant selector and you are growing plants, you will look at not only the smell, but the leaf surface, the glands, the chemical profile is extremely important. And also how easy is it to put this into a crop? And that's why you cannot actually harvest the graviolins or the capitatum or the rodents on its own and expect to get a profile that is will be accepted and also the yield would not be correct. So what you see is um, a sterile plant, beautiful, people just love it. It's got so many applications and our dream in South Africa is actually to keep on improving on this crop so that you don't have to spray. You don't have to put um, you know, uh, pesticides or anything else so that you can get a profitable crop from this three uh, mother plants that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, th this plant is used so today, but you want to further improve it. And what is the biggest challenge uh, with the plant today? What, what would be the most important trait to improve? Um, first of all, in, it, it is an economic factor. The plant yields still with the variety that is hybridized that we are using is still having a very low yield. So people have to make money per hectare per year. And we have to increase that yield without sacrificing quality. So it, it's that's the fine balance. Now, we do need to have more oil per, per leaf surface, but at the same time, we don't want to add to match chemicals, and we want to have a plant that is resistant to um, the second factor is diseases. So there is Phytophthora, there's Fusarium, there's quite a lot of diseases that, that is prone um, you know, for this plant. And we need to make our plants resistant to that with keeping the right quality and an economic viable yield. So that's the challenges that we are facing. A farmer will simply do a next species if the plant is not yielding, um, you know, the correct, uh, the correct um, chemotype, um, chemical profile, and if it's not yielding enough oil, they won't do it. Even if the price is good, it has to be enough. Mm. So what would be the strategy to take to try to make the plant have a higher yield and a better resistance? You said it's sterile, so there's no possibility to continue crossing that plant into other plants. So where, where would you start? There's a lot of researchers doing this all over the, um, and the globe. Actually, I'm working with correspondents in France that are looking at the DNA. So we're going back to the mother plants and we're looking at, you know, if, if we can um, improve basically from the first start of the plant. And there are chemotypes even in the capitatum. Um, some of our top researchers have found 15 to 30 different chemotypes just in capitatum. So it's really back to the drawing board, you know, if we really want to, in, um, to improve this. And then you, you keep on crossing it back so that you will have um, the right profile. These, these days, everybody is testing for quality. And we have to make sure that we are not going to sacrifice for the sake of quantity. Um, but that we will keep it um, keep it up there. So the capitatum is for the rosy smell with completely the wrong um, growth form, and it's not really a strong plant. It will be susceptible to frost. It won't take droughts. And as we are facing climate change, that's something we need to take into account. Whereas the graviolans and the rodents is actually more uh, adapted to uh, to drier conditions but it's got a lemon scented um, note and it's got a minty scented note. So you don't want that um, too much in the, but you want it in the background of the rose. So um, we're looking at the roots because uh, the soil diseases is attacking the roots and the plant without roots will not produce. 
so that we do need to look at revisiting the plant, make it a strong plant so that it can be a um, very competitive choice of crop against fruits and vegetables and flowers and so many other things that you could grow. Are there any beneficial microorganisms that could help the plant withstand, especially when you say it's in the soil? I absolutely love the question because that was my passion when I started researching 21 years ago. It was exactly that. Um, in nature, the plants are fine. They don't have this. The minute you hybridize it, you put it into mass planting, into a land, that, that's when it gets attacked. Also, because previously there might have been tobacco planted or some other plants that, you know, where the origin of this um, pathogens actually came from. So, yes, there is this, this fungus that can actually be inoculated onto the plant, and that's what we are hoping to find the solution for. So it's not a, a chemical, but like, rather an ecological solution. To this and it's um it's getting a lot of attention at this stage we saw successes during the world cup when we had to plant all the soccer fields we also had problems just didn't want to grow fast enough thick enough you know for the due dates and then we also saw that beneficial fungi to be inoculated with a blonde was the answer so that's what we're looking Beautiful that this is working. Now, my next question is sometimes when you inoculate plants with these microorganisms, they have the potential to change the chemical profiles in the leaf. Has that been assessed whether that's happening when you use this beneficial fungus? You know, the, um, that is also the next step that we are looking at. And thanks to a lot of researchers that are taking hands, we can actually, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we can see what has been done and take stock of what was found and built on that. So far, we have not seen um, a dramatic change on the chemical profile. And actual fact, we saw that where there was the highest um, density of the fungus, we actually had the, the, the best profile and plants react to certain stresses in the environment. They have different enzymatic actions. So we, we are aware that it might be, uh, you know, changing the, the chemical profile, but so far we have not found that to be a negative factor. Mm -hmm. But we keeping on research, you never know what happens. And um, it's interesting to see this mother plant that we have, how um, it, it has been hybridized and you know, the development will keep on going and how it's adapted to conditions in India, uh, which is different in some ways to um, the conditions in South Africa, especially on the Western coast where Capitatum is actually coming from. And then how fantastic it's doing in Egypt along the Nile, you know, so, and then um, I've looked at how it's intercropped with uh, vegetables in China because it also keeps insects away. So that's very interesting. And um, you know, the, the more days, the more things we actually find out. I don't think we will ever be at a stage where we've done it all. The, the idea that when you plant it in different regions, when you plant it on different uh, landscapes, in different countries, in different climate zones, that will for sure influence the chemical profile if I relate to, for example, production of wine. Uh, that is like depending where, whether the stock is old or young, whether it grows on a slope on the top of the mountain or in the valley, you get a completely different taste of the wine when you drink it in the end. So how about the chemical profile of, um, of the rose geranium oil, uh, depending on where it comes from? And that, that is a very, a very interesting and very important question. And yes, like wine, it does get um, influenced by the height above sea level, by the winds, by the, 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 the you know, the hours of sunshine. And we've we formed a database where we're actually documenting that and to see where it is best, yeah, best performing. And what we found is the higher you go above sea level, the better the quality. And with quality, it's got nothing to do with the method of distillation. It's actually the certain components which determines the price of the oil that does get influenced, like the linalol, the geraniol, and the citronellol. Those are the you know, are things that we are watching. But then also, the lower you go down to sea level, the higher your yield. 
So it's a fine line between the the economic thing and you know to really get uh, get good quality. And it looks like um, the plants just um, do prefer um, a winter rainfall, but the graviolans being part of the hybrid makes the plant actually much more adaptable to summer rainfall area, also inland, and also less affected by the height above sea level. So yes, that is definitely something that we are looking at. And also on the same farm, the same practices, year to year, just like wine, it might differ. And then the the stresses from the environment, whether there's insects or whether there's too much sun or not enough water, the plants react. It's a it's a natural um, product, so it will react to those stresses. Then the key would be to find the medium way. And I can actually share now, we're encouraging our communities to also be involved in the planting of this. And sometimes you have to take what you've got. You don't have a choice of your land. So making most of your land with what you've got is what we are, are aiming at. Best agricultural practices, keeping an eye on what the market wants, and at the same time, making it economically viable. Mm -hmm. The geranium oil is used in many different products. Does the profile define in which products it is more suitable to be used? Or is is there no correlation between the, the end product that includes the geranium oil and the profile of the oil itself? Um, originally, it, it does matter. We, of course, the aromatherapists who use a lot of our oil want a specific um, you know, profile. But then also the oil is getting very scarce. Because of the low yield, people rather jump and switch crops. So the scarce of the oil, the less um, uh, you, you know, requirements are being put onto, you know, onto the oil. They just want the oil. And then they will, from there on, and I think that is what's happening now, not only what you're running with other oils as well, they will simply change the oil to fit to, to what they want, which is not ideal, but that is the truth. And that is realistically what is happening. And for that reason, you find a lot of geranium on the market being completely fake, synthetically put together, adulterated. And we see that all the time. But um, with, with the technology that we have today, we are able to identify uh, with certain markers whether the, the oil is authentic, whether it's original, or whether it has been changed or adulterated or even diluted, or colored. We have seen um, that happening. And that is what's, you know, what's, what's the result of an oil that is um, getting scarcer and scarcer. You get all this tricks of the trade, as I can call it. I mean, um, a, a biochemist can actually make geranium oil from components of other oils, like certain times types of uh, lemongrass. You can actually compile a geranium profile. Mm. And that is a threat to the, you know, to, uh, to the uh, geranium producers because they would like to be competitive with quality and also at the same time pricing. You can't price yourself out of the market just because you've got, in your view, the best oil because people can make it cheaper. And that is happening as we speak. Is there any kind of quality control or certification, so any, any kind of way for the consumer to know if this is an original geranium oil or if this is a synthesized one? Yes, there is, there is a lot of quality control um, measures in place. People are insisting on a GC analysis, which we um, encourage our producers to have, um, you know, full GC analysis to see what all the components are, also to see if there are any traces of um, heavy metals or pesticides for that matter. And we in South Africa, are at the, at the stage now, we have our writing standards for our oil that we can distinguish the South African oil, for example, from one in China, from another one in India, and also to identify where the markers are. So you can see where does this, this oil actually come from. But it's very slow, but the good news is it is happening. Um, and people are very quality conscious all over the world. People will insist on a certificate of analysis when they buy your oil. And they will go and test it as well on their own to see if your oil test 
is showing what they what they want. So um, some of our producers are organically certified. So there's also that certificate um, that's coming um, along with that. And um, I think all the certifications together helps on this quality awareness that we are trying to also establish in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the um, to the biolo biological function of the components in the oil on, for example, the human body, What's the what's the effect of um, the components of the geranium oil? We had here citronellol, linalol, and geranol. Um, and how is how would the effect be different when you buy um, like a synthetic oil? Let's say still free of any kind of adverse substances, but not the same profile. What could you expect as a different effect? Um, well, I'm not um, an aromatherapist, but I can only say what I heard from from them. I can definitely see, um, you know, if the levels of linalool is not high enough, or even if it is too high. And and I have had um, experience where I had to travel with the geranium, and the bottle broke, the sample bottle broke in my bag, so all my shoes was drained with the geranium. And, It affected um, my sleeping pattern. I couldn't sleep <laughs> for, for five days. I just couldn't sleep. I could rest and I could manage to work, but um, I, I could see on the clock, that, you know, that I didn't sleep well. And apparently that's one of the things that, that they can detect and it will interfere or will change um, certain things like relaxing. Instead of relaxing, you it might activate you. And, uh, you know, that's the type of things that they will look at. And remember, geranium is also now used for uh, as a preservative. It's used um, for, for people um, in treatment of cancer. I'm not putting claims down here, but I'm just saying we've picked it up. And also for um, stimulus of blood flow to the skin. So for cellulite, and I think that's where the citronellol level it, it's, is coming in. So definitely, um, I, I do think further tests and further quality measures is very important in this. And we like it when people actually report back and say, this oil was not as effective as that oil. And, you know, we would like to investigate it and do another test. So we really like to take hands with any researchers that are looking at this at this aspect. It's very important um, to us to know, you know, if there's changes, for example, in the profiles, we need to know that. And so that we can be honest and open about it to the people who buy the oils. Mm -hmm. What is the function of these oils inside the plant? Yes, it's a defense mechanism. It's really interesting. Um, so it, it's, it, it will deter um, some uh, sucking insects, but at the same time, we did find uh, a leaf hopper on some of our crops, especially when, you know, it's a beautiful crop and the more luscious and green it is, it's, it's like more attractive it is to, to insects. And, and yes, it also acts as a push and a pull if you plant it in, um, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a companion plant or intercropped. We also see that it, that's actually, it deters the insects. It actually interferes with the pheromones. And insects don't like to be confused. They want, you know, they like to be focused. So the essential oils and specifically the geranium oil, um, and it's, I think it's a citronellol that's in there, confuses them and then they can't find their path, you know, they, they can't operate on that. Whereas we also did see um, a little bit of um, a, a grasshoppers on it, but not too much damage. It's like they only take a bite and, and then take off. There's no rodents that eats it. I don't think they like the smell. There's no mammals that eat it, even hungry cattle um, didn't you know they trampled the plant but they didn't eat it but the plants are very prone to to attacks um, by termites and that is a problem that we have, have to face because you're not allowed to spray for you know for termites but at the same time there's an underground perfumery going on while you're looking at your plants because they just love the plants so there's ways that you need to look at now what how do you manage that Mm -hmm. And they are all, as you say, they are all grown outside on fields. So that makes it also difficult for treatments. If you would have them in a, 
like more controlled environment. Um, but there you probably don't get up on the volumes that you need. Yes, we have done trials. We found a, a very high yield in, um, in an enclosed area, like in a tunnel or in um, hydroponics. We did find that. But uh, geraniums don't like too much water. And, you know, your control when it's enclosed area is very critical when it comes for too much water. And then you have other diseases, um, you know, coming into enclosed areas. So the plants do actually better in open land. If only you can you can stop the termites from making a perfumery underground, then then you have a good crop. Mm -hmm. That's very After plants like vetiver. Um, we found this be a, a, a very good companion. If you border your land with vetiver, the termite don't get past the vetiver. So um, that might be one of the biological solutions um, for the future. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, there's lots of uh, experiments and research done on especially that, how we can deal with like the plants that we have and their specific um, capacities to deter the specific diseases, how we can combine them in order to, to protect other plants. It also means that, uh, of course, you sacrifice some of your land to those plants for planting them. That takes space, but uh, in return, you may be able to to avoid using um, using certain types of chemicals, and I believe, especially, uh, what are, what are the regulations for using herbicides and pesticides, uh, especially when it comes to extraction of essential oils afterwards that are used in medical products, partially and in in cosmetics. Um, that, that is something that's very close to our hearts and our biggest buyers are actually in aromatherapy and pharmaceutical industries and they're very strict on that. So you constantly have to keep checking and if you've got a certificate of organic production, you dare not put a foot wrong because you will lose your, your certificate. And the reason why we pursue that is our producers also get a premium price for the, you know, for the high quality. So I don't think we will ever be able to compete with uh, with quantity with other countries, but we are trying to really position ourselves with good quality at least by keeping a check uh, you know, on all of that and not spraying and keeping to the rules of the organic certification. Mm -hmm. How important is the uh, production of rose geranium oil for the soci socioeconomic um, um, positioning of South Africa? Um, it is very important, um, you know, per hectare per year, and that's how the units that we use in South Africa, we really want to create jobs. Um, but not only that, we also want to enhance skills development and, you know, and, and add full value so that we have um, maximum opportunities for our people. And it is a very attractive um, um, industry for our rural people. It's It's like really enhancing their status. It's not just harvesting vegetables, you are harvesting something that's going into, into perfume and into soaps and into wonderful candles and into lotions and potions. So we really don't have to sell the idea to the rural communities. The women especially, they love this. And they they come themselves because they, uh, I think they, they can feel this uplifting feeling working with something else than their ordinary agricultural, um, uh, you, you know, things. And there's not been a lot of mechanization so far in this industry. Still things are, are done by hand. So the opportunities for job creation is really very good. And, 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 and for women, that's really what we need, you know, for them to be involved in something that I love is good for their, <clears throat> for their self-esteem. And they can see where it goes to. Some of our producers are having on their farms, they've got little shops where they make <coughs> crafted cosmetics, um, soaps and candles, and they are even involved in that. Out of season, they do value adding. So this is really, a, really a beautiful crop to be mm. involved. Um, every day, I just, I'm so thankful that I can be exposed to see this. Mm. It's an, empower, an empowering um part of using plants for, for like establishing a business also for these women yes, or also yes. for men that work in, in this area. The men is involved in more, you know, driving the, 
the tractors and operating the distillation units and so on. But I see how the women enjoy and love the work. Mm -hmm. Um, I also was wondering when it comes to um, distillation, for example, can you describe the process from the plant itself to the essential oil? What steps are involved in this? And also maybe does every person who grows the geraniums or the pelagoniums, <laughs> does everybody have their own equipment or is it operated as like cooperatives where people share equipment? Uh, most of the time the producers are having their own distillation units on the farm because we have worked out an, an economic model. If you travel more than 25 kilometers with your harvested material, then you, you will not make, um, make a profit. So most of them are doing it. There's a few outgrowers, but they um, you know, try to not travel more than 25 kilometers with the harvested material. And also, um, you, you know, the whole process, you can wilt the plant slightly, then you get more plant material into your vessel. But if it's going to be transported like uh, in 24 hours time over a long period, some of the oil is actually so volatile, you will lose some of the um, um, of the oil. So it, we're trying to get it in the vessels as quick as possible. Slightly wilting um, is allowed. Um, and also what we see is, um, um, you know, you get a better quality if you do it as quick as possible. So it's basically um, a steam distillation that, we, that we're using. Most of us are using wood as a, a you know, burning wood as, as an energy source. And then the water is steamed and the steam is then pushed through the harvested material, very much like the classic lavender and, 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 and lemongrass are done in other countries. And then that um, is condensed into a condenser. And then you get the separation of the, the water and, and the oil. The water has got a different density than the oil. So that, that will be for geranium, the oil is always on top. So then you have to um, separate that or you funnel it. So, and then now the water also has got a new market for hydrolat or hydrosols. And that changes uh, the economic picture now. In the past, we just put that water back into the pond, but it's recirculated now. And at the certain stages, you can also sell that. People are making hand sanitizers and they're making all kinds of things with the byproduct. Um, you know, coming from, coming from the water. The yield is still very low from one ton of plant material, which is the leaves and a little bit of flowers, you get about one kilo of oil. So that's a lot of energy and a lot of work that goes into, and that's the reason why it is expensive and why it's not every um, person is doing it. It is, it is hard work and it's not a lot of oil for all your effort. So if the price is right, if the quality is right, then it, it does um, become a very attractive and people will consider doing that. Most of the time, they also have other crops. So it can be uh, like a separate or a second, a second income for our producers. Um, we don't want to sacrifice food security with our, in our agricultural sector, but it's very nice to see how um, it's done together with macadamia of fruit, like mangoes, it goes beautiful in mango areas. And also alongside keeping, keeping natural areas open and, and conserved. Mm -hmm. That's an, uh, I think, an, a beautiful idea to see that you can cultivate. It's also in uh, avoiding monoculture. If you can cultivate many different plants beside each other and have your living coming out of, of more than just one crop, also with the thought that, well, there can come diseases and one crop can be, uh, be harmed, but the others uh, will withstand and you will still secure your income from those ones. We've seen excellent results when you grow it together with Moringa and also with uh, fruit crops like mangoes. The geraniums will repel the fruit flies from the mangoes. So the, the producer is then able to have organic mangoes and organic um, geraniums at the same time. So uh, for me, that was really something that, that we love to see more and more. Mm -hmm. 
when it comes to the, uh, you said one ton of material, one kilo of uh, essential oil, that's a lot of biomass that you have still left afterwards when you have extracted the, the essential oil. Um, um, what is happening to this remaining biomass after the extraction? Can that be used for anything? Um, yes, it is. It's used directly in, back into composting. Um, so you, you improve the organic material on your land. And um, you, of course, they let it cool down because it, you know, it's, it's very hot when it comes out of the vessel. It's steaming. You can't put it <clears throat> directly back on the land, but it's cooled down and it's chopped down because what you have now is um, sterilized compost. And, and that goes then back onto the land, especially the people um, that, you know, that are certified organic, which are not allowed to put um, chemical fertilizers. That's what they do. They just build it back into the soil. And it's, it's, it's this huge heaps that you see, you know, that's, that's going to, to be composted. And people also sell that because of, it still has a bit of a smell. So um, it, it, it gives a lovely smell to, to compost. Not everybody likes the smell of compost. And, and so it, it really goes back into, back. most of it goes back into the land. Here and there, people are also composting it into bags and selling it. Mm -hmm. But every, every bit is used. And is there, uh, now we had the, the, the leftovers are used, the starting material is tried to be improved. Uh, is there any ways that you can improve, like make the, the extraction process more energy efficient using other, other energy sources is what, what kind of developments are going on on that level yeah, we have serious electricity challenges in south africa so we have realized the, the value of using solar power um, energy and, and alternative methods so we are looking at using um, um, solar energy for starting up, for you know, for warming up the pot, but it is not enough to take us right through. And in cloudy and windy days, it's really important. So, but there's a lot of advancements. Some of our fruit and wine farms now are completely solar. So, um, it's it's coming, and it's but it's still expensive for the new incoming in entrepreneurs. It's still expensive. The technology, um, you know, it's it's not widely available. But I can see the move towards that. Definitely, it's going. And then people are also using other methods. Um, for example, vibration, you know, to actually loosen the the glands and to get the oil off easier, so that when you at the end um, distill it that you have less energy that you have to spend and you have maximum um, yield coming off your plant. So there's a lot of, of work going on at the moment for that. And uh, we also see that there's a lot of ingenious people coming up with ex you know, extremely good plans. And I, I, I keep on watching um, even the, the color of the soil, for example, if it's a lighter color, then you push up uh, the yield and also for some reason, it's also that the oil comes off quicker and easier. So your distillation time might be shorter, but all of these things still have to be further developed. And I do think that uh, research is very important in this in, in the energy aspect that we, that we see there. We also have um, people that are re, um, recycling a lot of, of the water and of the um, of the material, it's going into all kinds of um, applications. So we try to minimize waste and maximize the the use of of if, of every step of the process. Even um, I mean, yeah, the water, the energy, the plant material, everything. The containers also, we, you know, we're also very conscious of um, of that. So we're trying to to make the most of that. Would you be able to say that there is a specific value in roast geranium oil coming from South Africa as compared to one, other ones produced in other parts of the world because of the different profile or because of other different aspects of it? Um, I would love to say yes, but the, 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 the chemistry will speak for itself. The, you know, the trade is only interested in the price and in the chemical profile. There's not a lot of sentiments really um, into where it comes from. But there are people that are buying with their hearts. 
and they, you know, for me, that is where the value would be. And it's in the it's in the country of origin. But we all are using products from all over the world. So, I mean, we are using products from other countries as well. We do need to distinguish our, um, our oil to make it really profitable um, of good quality at this stage, because we know that we cannot get to the tonnage that's currently produced by Egypt, by China. And I see even India is really pushing up the the production. We are um, uh, really a lot slower in the volumes, but we are really trying to make up, you know, with the quality, uh, you know, being authentic, being from the country of origin, we are trying, and at the same time, to the benefit of our communities. That's very important to us. Where is the majority of the oil exported to from South Africa? At this stage, most of it is going to um, to France to and also to other EU countries, but the bulk is definitely going to France. A little bit is going to the, the US, um, a little bit is going to Australia, and um, yeah, and even India has been buying from South Africa. They did not have enough, you know, for themselves. So the, the UK will be using it more, more in flavoring. France would be using it into perfumery. Um, into the US, it's going into aromatherapy and into pharmaceutical uh, applications. So that's basically how it's differentiated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I have gone through all my questions that I had here. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share that I haven't asked? Um, well, yes, I would like to thank you for the opportunity um, of, of telling uh, the people, you know, the, the real story about uranium and where it really comes from and, and the progress. We're really looking to improvement in, in future. And we, uh, we want to share that with, with everybody. The, you know, the smell of, that, um, of the rose uranium, I know it's called the poor man's rose, but it's really beautiful on its own as well. There's so many um, applications that hasn't been touched, for example, in, in food, in culinary. Um, and it's coming more and more. I can see there's a wave coming for using essential oils more and more in food, but the safety would be up to address. And that's what we're looking um, forward to, more and new applications. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think this uh, gave us a lot of uh, new knowledge about how, about the challenges and the opportunities in the industry, about the biological background and the biological challenges as well, but even in the process and in terms of what it means to the people. So that was um, a beautiful uh, summary about the rose geranium oil. And really, I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this for me. If people wanted to know more about you and about the South African Essential Oil Producers Association, where could they find more or more about your research, for example? Uh, we have got um, a, a website, so they can look at our website. It's sayopa.co.za, or they can also send me an email to sayopa at gmail.com. It will come straight to me and I can help them. If I can't, I'll refer them to somebody who can help them. We really like to take hands with more people in this industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. I really appreciate it. Isn't it beautiful how such an interview came about because Karen reacted to one of our previous episodes and I could invite her so that she could share her insights and expertise with us. Um, I think that's really what uh, my idea with this podcast was, that I would, I would take a subject, um, something that is relevant for you that you can relate to, that is also maybe seasonal, like pelargoniums are now back in the shops if you are not a collector, but you buy them in a shop. Um, and that's how knowledge comes about, that we reach out and we build this together. With this, I also would like to invite you to give some feedback on this uh, on this podcast and on the episodes that we have had, whether you have uh, listened only to one or to several ones, this would be great. And that would allow me to see what you liked about it, what I can do better, and also what kind of subjects we will cover in the future. And 
If you like, um, you can leave your email address when you reply to the questionnaire and then you will, will be put into a little lottery where you can win one of our colorful aprons on our linen aprons from the latest collection. So please go in. I will put the, the link to the questionnaire into the show notes so you can click there. It's a very short uh, some questions to answer. It takes you five minutes and you will have until the 5th of May and we will draw the winner of the apron after, after that date and inform you by email if you have left your email. With this, I say thank you very much for listening. If you haven't listened to the other Pelagonium episodes yet, you're very welcome to explore them as well. And next week, we will start a new mini-series about a new genus of plants, but I don't yet tell you more. There's going to be a little trailer next week, Wednesday, where we will reveal what the plant will be that we dedicate the next month to. Have a lovely day and thank you for tuning in and listening to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea. 